Stand by. This is your one minute warning. Stand by. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning to everyone who's tuned in right now. Uh, my name is Nirav Shah, and I am the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. <clears throat> and we begin, again, today's briefing with some unfortunate and sad news. Uh, the Maine CDC is able to report that two additional individuals in Maine have passed away with COVID-19. The sixth such individual was a woman in her, in her 80s from Cumberland County. The seventh was also a woman in her 80s and also from Cumberland County. Both women were hospitalized at the time of their death. This brings the total number of deaths in Maine in individuals who were diagnosed with COVID-19 to seven. As always, the thoughts of the staff at the Maine CDC are with the family members of these latest two individuals as they mourn the grieving and their death. I can also report that the Department of Health and Human Services office in Lewiston has reopened Commissioner Lambrew herself was there on Monday morning for that reopening. And we, of course, continue to wish our colleague who is in that office all the best on a speedy recovery. Uh, in terms of the cases, at present, Maine CDC is reporting 344 total cases of COVID-19 in the state of Maine. This is an increase of 41 cases since yesterday. COVID-19 has also been detected in one additional county, which is Hancock County, with one case. As we've mentioned, there are other counties where there have been at least 10 cases of COVID-19 detected. And our team of epidemiologists right now is analyzing those, working with the investigators to determine it, whether 25% of those meets the threshold for what we would determine to be community transmission. At this time, we have not satisfied that second threshold in order to determine that community transmission has occurred in any counties in Maine other than Cumberland and York counties. All told, 63 individuals in Maine have been hospitalized at some point during their COVID-19 illness. And as of today, 80 individuals have recovered. All in all, Maine CDC has fielded now close to, th close to 4,000 consultations with healthcare providers and other staff around the state in connection with our COVID-19 work. I'd also like to provide a very quick update on the Oxford Street shelter situation. We've now detected two cases of COVID-19 and individuals associated with that shelter. And our staff and team of epidemiologists and public health nurses continue to work with city leadership and shelter management on that situation. I'd like to turn next to some updates on the laboratory testing front. 
One of the numbers that we are always trying to keep tabs with in laboratory testing is how many tests we have on hand, how many tests we can conduct at any one time. And as of this morning, Maine CDC has sufficient supplies on hand to conduct approximately 4,000 COVID-19 tests. I can also report that in Maine, at least 8,400 individuals have tested negative. I'd also like to provide an update on something that we discussed a few days ago, and that is the use of more rapid tests as we think about our diagnostic strategy for COVID-19. And as I discuss this, I'd like to draw a link, to draw a straight line between two challenges that we have had nationwide in the COVID-19 outbreak. One is rapid diagnostic testing. The other is the availability of personal protective equipment. Now, those two things might seem as if they're a little bit disconnected. But what I'd like to do is demonstrate and talk about why they are very, in fact, closely connected and why the announcement that I'm able to make is really critical. A fair amount of the personal protective equipment that is used by frontline healthcare workers is used when they do not yet know whether a patient that they are helping is COVID-19 positive or negative. And while they are waiting for that test result on that patient in the ER or in the hospital, they have to do what's reasonable, which is assume that the patient might be positive and take the necessary PPE precautions as a result of that. If that test on that patient comes back negative, all the PPE that was used in retrospect, in hindsight, we can say might have been better conserved for a patient that was positive. And so if we can shorten the amount of time between when a patient comes in with signs and symptoms and when they get a negative test, we can reduce that PPE usage. To put that differently, a rapid diagnostic test in and of itself is a PPE conservation strategy. That's why I'm able to announce today that Maine will soon be able to take possession of 15 of the new Abbott Laboratories ID Now platforms. We will also be able to take possession of approximately 100 test kits. Each test kit alone can conduct 24 tests bringing Maine's rapid diagnostic capability to approximately 2,400 tests. This has a number of benefits. The first is that patients can very quickly learn whether they are positive or negative, and that, from a psychological perspective alone, can provide a high degree of comfort and solace to patients who are not well. It also has treatment implications because healthcare providers can start taking immediate measures based on that result. From a public health perspective, from a systems perspective, from a PPE perspective, one of the principal benefits of having these Abbott tests will be that it can be the foundation of a PPE conservation strategy. Because if a patient tests negative, Healthcare providers can discontinue the use of much of the PPE and conserve that life saving vital resource for patients who test positive. I'll have many more details to come in the next coming days in terms of how we will be using these tests, but I thank and commend our colleagues at Abbott for helping us secure these tests. As I've mentioned, the benefits of this test will be manifold across the system for patients, for physicians, and for conservation of our vital personal protective equipment. Finally, on the laboratory testing front, we will soon be shipping out a set of tests to LabCorp uh, to, in order to get results as quickly as possible back for those patients. 
I'd like to turn next to an update on our PPE distribution. To recap, the first large wave of PPE distributed by Maine CDC in partnership with our colleagues here at MEMA and the Department of Transportation, that first large shipment went out over a week ago. Subsequent smaller shipments have gone out as well. A smaller shipment went out on Monday. But in the, in the recent days, Maine CDC has received larger shipments of PPE from the Strategic National Stockpile. We received our second so-called 25% allocation. We've also confirmed that, as I've mentioned at these meetings, we received a much larger allocation approximately a day and a half ago to our warehouse. We have confirmed that that allocation that we received a day and a half ago for the time being will be the last allocation that Maine receives from the Strategic National Stockpile. Maine continues to pursue other alternatives to acquire and secure personal protective equipment. That includes ordering PPE on the private market, as well as working with the manufacturing community here in Maine to see what domestic or state level production capacities there might be. In terms of these latest two shipments that Maine has received from the Strategic National Stockpile, our public health emergency team right now is reviewing the existing orders, is working at the laboratory to pull and fill those orders, and start distribution of those orders starting on Friday. Finally, I'd like to provide a quick update on the availability of critical assets that we monitor here at Maine CDC. The first is the total, <clears throat> the total number of ICU beds. At present, there are 272 ICU beds across the state, 124 of which are available. There are approximately 348 ventilators across the state, 271 of which are available. And of these alternative ventilators, a, a rather new category authorized by the US FDA, there are approximately 128 that are available. You may have noticed that the numbers that I've reported there have been going upward over the past several days. And the reason for that is hospitals, more and more hospitals, are continuing to report into Maine CDC. I commend and thank the hospitals for reporting those numbers to us as they are vital as we are doing our planning work. So that's one reason the numbers have gone up, and I'm very thankful to the hospitals for reporting those numbers in. So with that, I'd like to pause. I know we have a number of folks on the line who've, who've got questions. So I'm gonna start with some folks on the line and then we'll turn it over to folks here in the room. And we will start with Don Kerrigan on the line from News Center. Don, go ahead. Don, would you like to kick us off? Okay, we'll come back to Don in just a second. We'll go next to Kate Koff from the Ellsworth American. Kate, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us, uh, considering how many hospitals in Maine outsource some staffing to national firms and bring providers in from out of state, is there a chance that that outsourcing might affect Maine hospitals? And um, if so, is there anything that the CDC can do to ensure staffing levels remain adequate? Good. So Kate's question is around hospital staffing. And given that many hospitals in the state of Maine outsource different pieces of their work, potentially to other parts of the country where, they, where, where there may be higher rates of COVID-19, A, do we have visibility into that? And B, what are our plans there? Uh, a, so Kate, the first is that we do have visibility into that. We've been working with hospitals at a very senior executive level to try to get a sense of what their own continuity of operations and emergency planning is. So that if, for example, some of, their, some of their vital work were outsourced to another laboratory in a hard hit part of the country, how we might be able to manage that. And so there are plans in place. That being said, 
Hospitals themselves have been working on these issues for quite some time, and we continue to work with them to make sure that they are thinking ahead and trying to see around the corners for where some of these vulnerabilities may be. It is certainly a challenge. Uh, we have a number of hospital groups that are working with hospital leadership to try to think about these exact issues. So very good question. It's something we're thinking about. I'm going to go to one more question on the phone, and then we'll go to the room. Uh, Kevin Miller from the Press Herald. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thanks for taking the calls again. Um, so my question is, can you shed any more light on the, um, the, the the transmission that we're seeing here in the state? I know you said Cumberland and New York are still the only uh, places with, with community transmission, but do you have any additional data as far as, you know, the other folks? Are they getting it from traveling out of state? Are they getting it from people they know? You know, what, what kind of breakdown can you give us on that? Great. Uh, so Kevin's question is from an epidemiological perspective. Uh, what other insights do we have on the cases that we've ha we, we have so far? Uh, and so a few, a few uh, observations, Kevin. The first is, of course, just the increase itself, uh, 41 cases just overnight. Uh, that is concerning to us. It is, however, largely consistent with what we've uh, seen in other states at their, when, when they were at the same point in their experience as we are in Maine right now. Uh, and just for numerical comparisons only, New Hampshire has roughly the same number of cases. Uh, I, I checked earlier this morning, and they were at about 367 cases. So even though the number is concerning, it is evidence of continued transmission across the state, across northern New England. Um, so, Kevin, in terms of other observations, uh, our, our epidemiologists right now, as we get new cases, are reviewing individuals' travel histories to see whether they have recently returned from a place with transmission or whether there's, it's likely that they've gotten the case while they were in Maine. Uh, right now, Kevin, I, I don't have much more to be candid with you in terms of other details. I know our epi team is working on that analysis to try to build it out a lot more uh, so that when we do have conclusions, they're based on a sufficiently high number of cases. So I, I don't have much more with, for you right now, um, but I do know that our EPI team is now really trying to get a better handle on what the exposure levels are and what the risk levels are. Um, so w when we've got that, Kevin, uh, please keep asking because I'll, we'll try to make sure we get more and more data as the analysis continues. Um, okay, great. And just one quick follow-up question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, and I, I think you've, you've answered this before, and I don't think the book the answer's probably changed, but um, is it too early for us to tell about what, how much of an impact the social distancing uh, measures that, that Mainers have been doing? Is it too early to tell what the impact of that has been on transmission rates? Good. So Kevin's question is whether we can say anything about the social distancing measures, physical distancing measures that have been put into place. Kevin, I want to answer your question in two stages. The first is to try to get a decent handle on what the magnitude of those physical distancing measures has been, and then two, try to get a sense of what, what's, what difference it's made. Uh, first, on the magnitude. There are two sources of data that, again, are, are not necessarily endorsed by Maine CDC. They're not categories of data that we manage, but we look to everything we can to try to get a sense of what's going on. And those two sources of data are, one, cell phone tracking data, that's produced and, 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 and generated by the cell phone companies. And then the other is traffic data, which is cataloged by the Department of Transportation. And on both fronts, what we've seen has been that travel, at least, and, uh, and by implication, physical distancing, travel has gone down, physical distancing has gone up. The travel piece we know from the DOT data and the physical distancing piece we have a good sense of from the cell phone data. The cell phone companies look to see how far people are, trans, are, are moving beyond their home address. Um, and what we've also seen is that the magnitude of at least travel, the magnitude of the reduction in travel has been the highest in Cumberland County. So those are all very positive signs. Uh, now, whether that's making any difference, uh, and there it is a bit too early to tell. The reason for that, Kevin, is, is simply because of the natural life cycle of the virus. It takes a, at least, at minimum, 16 days before any changes to be able to be detected 
after the introduction of something like physical distancing requirements. And so we're now, you know, that, that kind of takes us back to around March 15th or so. Um, and so although at this time we don't have a good sense of whether it's made a difference, we do know from historical experience that it does make a difference. What also complicates this, Kevin, is that most everyone else across this part of the, the country is engaging in the same physical distancing requirements. So we don't have a natural experiment to compare ourselves to. But to recap, we do know that physical distancing has been engaged in. People are taking the governor's recommendations, requirements seriously. And based on historical data and other large outbreaks, we know that this is one of the keys right now. To put a sharper point on that, Right now, physical distancing is the best vaccine that we have for COVID-19. So thanks for that question, Kevin. We're going to turn to the room. We'll start with Caitlin. Oh, thank you. I didn't raise my hand yet. Um, two short questions. Um, how many people are currently hospitalized? I know you said 63 have been at some point. And um, is there still a backlog of 600 tests that you said that you were going to send to okay. um, North Carolina? Great. Uh, so Caitlin's questions are, one, current hospitalizations. I don't have that number for you right now. We are, again, we're changing our, our, our epi system so that we'll have better visibility into current hospitalizations, current intensive care unit use. Uh, what happens right now, or what has to happen, is that the hospitals have to report that to us. And then we've got to verify that every single one of their reports is in a confirmed case as opposed to, say, someone they're testing. So we're getting to that point and having the data be accurate, something that we can rely on, takes, takes a little bit of work, to be candid with you. Our team is working on that, and I do anticipate very soon we'll be able to have better daily updates on the current number of hospitalizations. And then in terms of the backlog, the backlog is even a bit lower now. Uh, I'm not, I don't have the exact number. I believe it's on the order of about 400. I will we'll confirm that and, and get that to you. But these are the individuals who are the lowest priority. Um, and, and these were individuals who are not healthcare workers, not individuals who are hospitalized, things of that nature. A large, reason for, a large reason for this exercise was, again, to have an emergency plan, a plan B in case a large number of folks at our laboratory became ill. We wanted to have practiced this process so that we've got a mechanism in place to keep testing going. You anticipate that those uh, 4,400 rapid testing will be used for more higher risk frontline people rather than lower risk? Um, yes. So uh, Caitlin's question there is, what's our approach to using these rapid tests? And the, the goal of the rapid test is multifold. Certainly, we want to get folks a quick, quick answer. We want healthcare workers to be able to make quick decisions. But from a public health systems perspective, one of the, the, one of the principal goals is to be able to reduce PPE usage, or rather engender PPE conservation. So in order to maximize those goals, we're looking at thinking, we're thinking about where to place them within the healthcare system to try to maximize all three goals. Uh, we're going to turn in here and, yep, go ahead. Got a little uh, either, uh, I over. I'll, Dustin or Joe, either one. Uh, I was just going to say, you said that you're getting more information from the hospitals. Can you give an update on healthcare workers and their cases, and are any of them actually hospitalized? Uh, so uh, Joe's question is around healthcare workers, the number of healthcare workers who have been infected, and whether any of them is hospitalized. At present, we still are recording 43 healthcare workers who have been affected, and we're not aware of any of them who have been hospitalized at this time. Dustin? Have decision makers coalesced around data now? Is that why we're seeing a coalescing around decision making? And by that, I mean a lot of governors coming out and issuing state of home orders yesterday, things like that. Is there a more cohesive toolbox? So Dustin's question is around, you know, have, has there been sort of a coalescing of some of the main strategies here? And, and Dustin, what I, what I would say is actually for, for a few weeks now, the principal strategies, the, the tools in our toolbox have been known to us. The root of really almost all of them have been these social distancing, physical distancing measures. Again, right now, physical distancing is the best vaccine that we have when it comes to dealing with COVID-19 in the absence of a, a chemical vaccine or a, a drug treatment. Um, I think what we've seen in recent days nationally is a few things. One 
is a continued uptick in the number of cases. Uh, the second is the need for a more uniform approach within states. Uh, the third is the need to send a clear signal, which I think Governor Mills's order and forthcoming orders will do. Uh, and then the fourth is a need for all states to be consistent in their approaches. Uh, and so I think that's kind of what's happened in recent days, is this need to recognize that we've had the tools in place We've generally known since the 1918 outbreak what the approach would be. What we're seeing now is a more concerted implementation of those various tools. Uh, I'm going to turn back to the phone, and then we'll start back with Brad. Um, we're going to start with John from WGME. Hi, Dr. Shaw. From what you're seeing right now, how common is it for those with a positive test result to experience a loss of taste and smell I was reading that some doctors want those symptoms to be added to the list of screening tools. Do you think they should be? So John's question is around some of the newer symptoms uh, that have been described in connection with COVID-19, chiefly a loss of taste or a loss of smell. Um, and uh, John, so th this, this loss of smell is, um, is something that has been described with a number of other respiratory viruses. The, the exact 100% clear, but I think all of us can appreciate that if you've got a really stuffy nose, it's difficult to smell and food doesn't taste the same. Whether that's a function of the virus, a function of congestion, it's not 100% clear yet. What I think is important, though, are two things. The first is that some of these other symptoms we've seen, a loss of smell, GI symptoms, are very common even within respiratory viruses. That's not necessarily unique to COVID-19 at all. Even other, other viruses in the same family as COVID-19, other coronaviruses, are known to cause those exact same symptoms. And now, whether those should be added to the list of symptoms that make someone a higher priority or a higher concern you know, one of the questions that has not yet been answered scientifically is what percentage of people who say have a loss of smell later go on to develop bona fide COVID-19? And right now, we don't have a clear answer to that. If it turns out to be 100% of people who develop a loss of smell are later found to have COVID-19, then certainly that would be an early warning sign and we'd want to test. But if it turns out to only be a very small fraction of people, one or two percent, which is something that is under investigation, then we have to think really hard because then we might end up testing a lot of people who don't ultimately have the disease. It, like a lot of questions, is a great scientific question, John, and more scientific research is ongoing. I'm going to turn next to Steve Missler from Maine Public. Steve, go ahead, please. Oh, thanks for taking the question, Doctor. Um, I, I, I'm glad you brought up this in um, the rapid testing because I, I was going to ask you about that today. Um, but specifically, I noticed yesterday, I believe it was, uh, Governor Grisham in New Mexico basically announced that because of the increased testing capacity there, that they have moved to testing um, asymptomatic people in congregate settings, nursing homes, and even within households where another person may have the, the, uh, the disease, but it, you know, the other one is not expressing or not you know, uh, demonstrating symptoms of any kind. Do you envision a time when Maine might be able to do some of that asymptomatic testing and because of this uh, ramp up in the testing capacity? And if so, when do you think that might be? Great. So Steve's question is, uh, in light of additional testing capacity, might we expand into testing asymptomatic individuals, folks who don't yet have symptoms? Uh, so I want to say two things, Steve. The first is that the availability and soon to be the rollout of rapid testing in Maine is something that, A, we're excited about because it will help conserve PPE and get people quicker results, and B, it's something that we hope to expand. Uh, this expansion then reserves additional tests at commercial laboratories and our laboratory for other individuals. With respect to asymptomatic testing or testing on people who don't have symptoms, according to the U.S. CDC, as well as according to Dr. Fauci, 
Testing of people who don't have symptoms has to be approached carefully. It's not that anyone's against it. The question is what to do with the result that comes back negative. So imagine two scenarios. Someone doesn't have any symptoms, and we test them, and they come back positive. Well, we know that they've been exposed. We know we need to quarantine that individual and pay close attention to them. But let's take that same person, right? This might be a person who lives in a household with someone else. They don't have any symptoms yet, and we test them, and they're negative. From a public health perspective, what do we do next? Do we test them six hours later? Do we test them the next day? Do we test them a week later? Do we do nothing? We don't have enough scientific evidence yet to know how to actualize and operationalize a negative test. A positive test, we know what to do. But a negative test, more data needs to be generated. And it really does depend on when someone is exposed and when we test them and then what we do. So the hesitancy around testing asymptomatic people is perhaps initially driv was driven initially by concerns about the availability of testing. But in my own mind, there are now equal concerns or questions about what the public health response should be for a negative test and whether we retest, whether we isolate anyways, et cetera. So that, that's, you know, there's, again, good scientific questions. I know that the colleagues and my, my counterparts at the U.S. CDC are thinking about this very carefully, uh, and we're waiting for some additional guidance on them. Good question, Steve, and we're going to wait and see when we get more data. I'm going to turn back to the room now and start with Brad. So many of these victims are now in their 80s. When I go to the grocery store, I see a lot of them wearing masks and things like that. But, uh, you know, what would you tell seniors out there? What other recommendations can you tell seniors to, to, to keep them safe? Yep. So Brad's question is <clears throat> special recommendations we might have for seniors. Um, and, you know, Brad, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you what, what I've shared with my mother, which is stay inside, Mom. Um, I know that many seniors may not have might need to go to the grocery store. Our request there is that they look into calling Meals on Wheels or reaching out to neighbors who might be able to grocery shop for them. But my recommendation is for seniors, individuals who have pre-existing health conditions, to stay inside. I recognize that may not always be possible, but this is a time when as much as I have asked everyone in Maine to extend a helping hand to neighbors, I think we also have to ask folks who are in need, who may be elderly or older and have pre-existing conditions, I think this is also a time we urge them to reach their hand out and ask for assistance as well. My request is that they stay in as much as possible, and when they can't, take precautions. Go to grocery stores during hours that are specially designated for, elder, for older individuals or those with pre-existing conditions. Or where possible, ask friends and neighbors to help them with those essential pieces of life activity. Caitlin, back to you. Um, yes, I know that Maine is unique, uh, but are there any other states where you see kind of like a similar trajectory unfolding? Um, I know like that obviously the governor has been kind of like just talking to other governors um, mm -hmm. and trying to see like when was the right time to um, put her um, stay at home order in, um, you know, are you kind of watching any state in particular to see what they are doing or how things are doing to try to like prepare for what happens in Maine? And um, you obviously you said the more hospitals are reporting back on the type of um, ICU beds they have and um, ventilators. Do you feel like there is still more reporting to be done or do you have a pretty good sense at this point of what's out there? Great. Uh, so Caitlin's first question is around other states that we look at, that we work with. And I, I should say, at, at my level and certainly uh, at Commissioner Lambert's level and at the governor's level, we remain in very close contact with, my, with our counterparts. Um, I, I have an almost nightly call now with colleagues of mine across the other 50 states, other health directors, to compare notes about what they're doing and how they're thinking of, of different questions. Um, and some of them are folks that I've worked with for many years, so they are folks that I, I go to quite a bit. But in terms of models or exemplars or comparators, um, certainly we look at our neighbor, uh, given that it has a somewhat, ge somewhat similar 
geographic profile as well as uh, somewhat similar age demographics, things like that. So we look to New Hampshire. Um, we're also, so we look to some states uh, to see where we are right now and benchmark ourselves against the here and now. We then simultaneously are looking at some states that might be a little bit, quote, ahead of us in their contending of the outbreak to get a sense of what might have worked and what might have not worked. And so for that, uh, I'm in pretty good contact with my counterparts in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Again, somewhat similar states, both in terms of size, maybe different populations, but somewhat similar profiles. And in terms of contending with the outbreak, they are a week to 10 days ahead of us. So, uh, and then I know, again, Governor Mills has mentioned that she's in contact with her counterparts in Pennsylvania and Kentucky. Uh, I happen to be very close colleagues with my counterpart in Pennsylvania and my counterpart in Arkansas and my counterpart in Washington. Uh, all of us have been in the job for a while, and so we chat quite a bit to compare notes about what's working, what strategies may not be working. So we do this in different ways. One is to see where we are right now, that benchmark. The other is where might we be going, that benchmark. And then a broader benchmark about strategies that have worked in other places. Um, and then your second question, Kate or Caitlin, was about hospital reporting. Um, Again, we're, we're asking hospitals to report more and more and more data to us on a more and more frequent basis. And we're actually at the point now where maybe a couple of weeks ago, one single person at the hospital may have been able to compile all the data uh, and report it in. But we have, we have asked hospitals for an increasing amount, so much so that multiple people at the hospital are probably having to come together to report into us we recognize that that's a challenge. We thank and commend them for coming, to get to coming together. In terms of how much more we have to go, it really is a function of how much more data we're going to be asking them for. So it's a bit of a moving dance. Um, we're going to continue to be asking for more data, which I anticipate will be will require more and more resources. But in recent days, we have seen the amount of reporting go up significantly. And so we're very, very pleased with that, very pleased with that right now that you think might be something Maine may want to adopt? Um, so the question is, are there other things that, say, Massachusetts and Rhode Island are doing that we may want to adopt? And I, I can say with confidence that the answer is, is no. Uh, the things that we are doing, I think, are, A, in concert with strategies, to Dustin's earlier question, concert with strategies that other states are collectively thinking about, and I think done at the right time. Uh, I'm going to go back to the phone and go to Paul Dwyer at WABI. New square footage uh, specific restrictions on people in stores in the executive order, how they were decided on, and how important this is in reducing the spread of the virus. Uh, Paul, I'm going to going to ask you to rewind uh, to the beginning of your question. I didn't catch all of it. Sorry about that. Um, can you talk about the specific uh, square footage restrictions on people in stores in the executive order and how they were decided on? how important this is in reducing the spread of the virus. Great. So Paul's question is about the specific and tiered restrictions around square footage that are in Governor Mills' executive order. And the basic thrust of it, Paul, is about reducing density. The initial executive order was a, was, had one standard, but the most recent one has multiple standards that account for the size of the institution, the establishment, and the number of people. And those are calculated just to try to maintain the minimum amount of density needed, as well as balancing the need for individuals to not congregate outside. So we can put a restriction in place on any store. In an extreme scenario, you might imagine saying only one person can be in a store at a time. But the problem with that is that it generates people congregating outside waiting to get in. So we've got to balance those two things, an acceptable density level in the store versus not encouraging congregation outside of the store. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Allison Ross at WMTW. Now, given that we are not counting out-of-state cases, how can Maine be sure that we have enough PPE to treat everyone that includes non-residents and residents? Great. So Allison's question is around our PPE projections. Uh, and what I can say there is that the way that we are thinking about PPE 
is by staying in very close contact with hospitals. Uh, Caitlin asked a moment ago about the reporting system that we have with hospitals and, and how we are keeping tabs on that data. So our approach right now is to continue to keep tabs and work with hospitals to monitor their usage of PPE and their needs for PPE, not on a you know, multi-month basis, but on a very frequent basis, multiple times per week, to keep tabs on the situation. That allows us to be nimble and make sure that we can balance the load of PPE that's required across the state at any one time. So that's kind of how we are going about deciding who needs the PPE the most. We do that based on what hospitals are reporting into us, A, about the number of patients they have, and then B, about their available stocks on hand. I'm gonna turn back to the room for one last round. Brad? Uh, we're getting a lot of people calling, wondering, you know, can they still go outside and exercise, do things outside? Uh, Brad's question is about the, avail the um, opportunity to exercise. And Governor Mills' executive order yesterday did specify very, very explicitly, uh, and thankfully, that exercise, you can still go outside. But there were tight parameters on how going, what, what it means to go outside. Uh, this does not mean going to a baseball game or a big sporting event to the extent such things are happening. It does mean, however, that individuals can go outside to a park and walk a dog or exercise in a park provided they do so, A, with other members of their household, and then B, maintaining that, 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 that definite physical distance around anybody else who does not live in the household. And I really do want to emphasize that physical distance piece. Right now, in the absence of a biomedical vaccine, that physical distance is the best vaccine we have. So we do want folks to continue to exercise. That's important, too but they, they should abide Governor Mills's order and A, do so with people in their own household, and then B, when they, when they do encounter other folks on the horizon, maintain as much physical distance as possible. Quick yep, go ahead. Uh, in York County, we have a crew down there. We see, we're see, they're seeing a lot of out-of-state plates coming in uh, to their house. I know the governor has the 14-day mandatory quarantine. But, uh, you know, realistically, they, they probably are going to the grocery store and things like that. I mean, what would you tell out-of-staters maybe who are watching? Um, I think I would refer you back to Governor Mills' comments on that yesterday. Um, you know, Governor, and there's more to be coming on that, but I think I would refer you back to Governor Mills' comments on that yesterday. Could you open that up? Yep, and I, I will do, I will do one more quick round of follow-ups from folks on the line, and then my apologies. I've, I, I may have to, to run really quickly. So, Don, back over to you. I, thank you, Doctor. Uh, I finally get my phone straightened out here. Uh, I have another social distancing question and then a, uh, a reporting question. The social distancing question, uh, do you have uh, CDC staff or others going to Bath Ironworks, for example, to see if they're following all the guidelines, how they're doing with distancing among the workforce with that large employer. And, and do you, did you have a second question, Don? Yes, the second question, which has come up in the past, but I thought I'd ask it again. We are getting more and more uh, comments from people that they want to know what towns uh, the virus is, uh, virus cases are in. And, New Hampshire is actually reporting towns, I believe, and maybe some other states. Are you reconsidering reporting towns? So the first question with respect to Bath Iron Works, again, there I would refer you to the governor's statements. But in addition, employers have an independent obligation, irrespective of anything CDC might do. Employers have an obligation to make sure that they themselves are taking measures to keep their employees safe. And that's what Bath Iron Works, that's what every single employer in Maine should be doing. It's what my team and I at Maine CDC are doing for our staff, et cetera. Now, with respect to other more granular level reporting, um, as we get more and more cases in certain areas and can meet certain thresholds to, for ensuring privacy, we are considering that. But for the most part, we're going to continue reporting our cases on a county level rather than at the town level. As, as more cases come in, we may continue to evaluate that. Uh, certainly, again, not ruling anything out. All options are always on the table, but right now we're going to be sticking with the county level because, candidly, 
whether a virus is in one town but not in another part of the county should not determine how, how people continue to take social distancing, physical distancing, and other preparations. I'm going to see if is anyone else on the phone. Any to the BIW question? I'm sorry. Do, we've been told that you had that CDC staff has either is going or has been there to check. Has that happened? Uh, what I will tell you is that every single employer in Maine has an obligation to keep their workplace safe as possible for every single employee there. Uh, I'm going to go to Caitlin, and then we'll do one more round uh, on the phone. Caitlin. Um, the rapid tests from Abbott, are those going to be administered by the CDC? Or are they going to be distributed to healthcare providers? And where will they go? Also, Good. how much will they cost? Okay, so uh, more questions on the Abbott test. Uh, in general, Caitlin, we're, there'll be more details forthcoming. Uh, they will not be administered by CDC staff. They will be administered by healthcare professionals at the institutions themselves. Um, in terms of the distribution of that, we're going to look at the data to make sure we do that distribution in a thoughtful, data-driven manner. Again, keeping in mind our goals of not only just getting responses back to folks really quickly, but trying to use this rapid test as a foundational piece of our PPE conservation strategy. So much more to come on that. Uh, one last round of questions on for folks on the phone. Hello? Yep. Doug Shaw, this is Kevin Miller with the Portland Press Herald again. Yep, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, following, up, following up on Kate, Caitlin's uh, question, I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, my understanding was that the Abbott technology was using a similar, the platform was used for strep and for other tests mm -hmm. as well, and that you know, this was kind of a new, a, an expansion of that. So am I right there, and if so, do you know how many doctor's offices in the state already have? that platform or is this entirely new platform so we're only going to have 15 statewide great great question kevin kevin's question is about some of the technical specifications of the abbott platform and you are correct kevin the abbott platform the machine itself is one that has already been in use for other infectious diseases like strep or most recently influenza but what is new and what is what is in in many respects really just instrumental for us is the cartridge. The cartridge is what does the test itself. If you want to run a flu test, you use one cartridge. If you want to run a COVID test, you use another cartridge. So our analysis right now, to kind of tie it to Caitlin's question, our analysis is A, to figure out which practices in Maine already have the machine, and then B, which ones don't but really could use it in order to effectuate our goals of reducing PPE and getting fast results back. So that's kind of the, the analysis we're doing. Uh, we want to roll these out thoughtfully, not haphazardly. We also want to roll them out quickly so that we can start effectuating this strategy. But Kevin, you are correct that it, the, the machine has been in use, but what has been new and what just received FDA approval uh, a few days ago is the cartridge itself. So with that, everyone, um, I, I thank you all for being here today. Uh, Robert Long will be in touch about the way that these briefings may be shifting in the future. Again, as we think more seriously about physical distancing, um, we will try to keep the